This is the news and talk of Texas. Now, it's the Rick Roberts Show on 820 AM, 99.5 FM, HD2, News Talk 820, WVAP. Well, I know there's got to be a few hundred million more like me just trying to keep it free. Rick Roberts starts. Rick Roberts starts right now. Three minutes after the hour. Glad you're along. 1 800 288 WBAP. 1 800 288 9227. All right. I'm asking you to, to reach in. And, and be as honest as you can possibly be. All right? This, uh, this topic, you know, transcends, well, the law is the law. I mean, I, I realize that. We're a nation ruled by law. That's what keeps us from being a third world banana republic. But, you know, you got to be honest about this. There's a father that's facing deportation. So he's taken refuge um, inside of Phoenix Church. You've probably heard about this church before because I've done this before. It's opened its doors to provide sanctuary to Jesus Baronis. He's now living inside the church with a with one of his kids. He's got five or six kids, I think. Um, his five-year-old son is battling leukemia. His wife is five months pregnant. They've got five kids. He's pleading with ICE not to deport him for the third time. Now, he's been ordered to surrender to immigration officers today. He says he's going to fight to stay there. His son, Jaden, is, uh, and, and of course, you got to take this with a grain of salt because I don't know who wrote this. Um, let me, um, it's a, it's a CBS news piece. I don't have the author's name, so I don't know if they are, you know, hugely liberal in their viewpoints, but uh, his son, Jaden, evidently is so scared his father will get deported, he refuses to leave his side at the Shadow Rock United Church of Christ. He's five years old. Uh, he gets leukemia treatments, and uh, his mother says the treatments are too toxic for her to handle the boy. Um, I don't really understand this because... Um, the way he's being treated, uh, they give him pills. You, you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, the father says, my wife can't give him the pills because she's pregnant. Uh, you know, my first bit of advice, not, they ask, not that they asked for it, you got five kids. Um, one is special needs. Maybe you ought to stop having kids. Uh, but that's, you know, that, I, don't, I don't want to detract from the story. Uh, Baronos is uh, the breadwinner of the family, and the U.S., he says, is the only country he's ever known. His parents brought him here uh, as a toddler in 1989. He's now 30 years old, married, five kids, one with leukemia, and his wife is pregnant again. Uh, he doesn't meet the requirements of the so-called dreamers, all right? To even apply for a green card, he would first have to leave the U.S., I think it's, what, 10 years? Maybe you remember. I think that's right. Um, yeah, Barona said, I don't have a DUI. I haven't killed anybody. Um, so he doesn't know why he's being deported. Uh, there has to be a price to pay, right? Uh, believe it or not, a CBS News correspondent, Manuel, uh, and I can't even begin to pronounce his last name uh he's hispanic but he did ask that question yes yes there should be a price to be paid what would you say to someone who doesn't agree with you staying the cbs reporter asked this i know i was blown away too but he asked and barona said well if people think i should leave the country they just don't like mexicans okay well, according to uh, Baronis, he was once caught driving without a license. He's been deported twice before in 2006 and 2010. Each time, he came back illegally. One time, he uh, made the crossing in the Arizona desert uh, to be with his wife and kids, who were all U.S. citizens. So, 
Sonia Baronis, his wife, five months pregnant now, worries about finding a job to make ends meet. His kids need him, and I need him. And you know what? I'm sure that's true. I'm sure that's true. Um, you know, you know as well as I do, if you've got kids and you're married and your wife's pregnant and you're the sole breadwinner, that's a lot of pressure. That uh, I'm sure she does need him. Um, the CBS news reporter asked, have you thought about what it would be like to have to say goodbye to them? This is supposed to be one of those ter- tearjerker questions. Uh, and of course, on cue, she started sobbing. It's going to be hard. On Thursday, uh, ICE denied Barona's last attempt to stay. His case is still under review. Reverend Ken Henselman which we may be talking to uh, in a little bit here, opened his church doors to Baronis. I think it was Friday evening, if I'm not mistaken. Um, And the CBS reporter um, asked, do you think you're harboring a criminal? And according to the preacher, he said he shouldn't be prosecuted. He should be lifted up, used as an example of what it means to be a father. Well, ICE declined to comment on that. Uh, This is not the first time this church has housed an undocumented immigrant, as they call them. Six other people have reportedly sought shelter there since 2014. Um, In the last four years, it's pretty well known for harboring people facing deportation. ICE agents, now, if they wanted to, they could legally enter the church with a warrant and arrest Baronis and take him away. But uh, ICE typically stays away from houses of worship because ICE, as a policy, considers churches sensitive places. So we'll have to wait to see what happens today, but of course it's caused a nationwide stir. Here this guy is, five kids, his wife's pregnant again. He's been deported twice. He came back twice illegally. Um, he doesn't meet the criteria, and I'm not sure why, it could be the age, um, of a so-called dreamer. Should some exception be made for this guy? I mean, he's he's got a wife, five kids, she's pregnant again. Um, he thinks if he has to leave, it's because America doesn't like Mexicans, and I would sh- assure him that's not the case. But I think perhaps... Um, You know, going to this church, I I guess he and his five-year-old son, because he can give the son the pills, uh, that's what I deduce from this, are living in the church uh, so he doesn't get deported. What should be done? I mean, this is a very difficult thing. Should ICE go ahead and get a warrant, you know, quietly go in, arrest him, deport him? He's just going to come back, right? He's got five kids and a wife that's pregnant. He's going to come back. So instead of talking about, well, what did Trump say? What did the Republicans say? What did the Democrats say? What did Nancy Nancy Pelosi say? Um, What did the minister say? What do you say? It's your country. It's it's your... See, I, I don't know how to make this any more clear than it is. This is your country. Anyone that's a U.S. citizen, this is your country. ICE, that's yours too. They're supposed to work on your behalf. What should be done with this guy? Should they go in and take the warrant, arrest him? Should uh, the preacher be held uh, in some form or fashion for harboring a criminal? Um, I mean, this is not your run-of-the-mill deport or not to deport. You see what I'm saying? Okay, 1-800-288-WBAP, 1-800-288-9227. And I know what, you know, some people are going to say, well, Rick, I thought you said you were a Christian. Well, I I try to be to the best of my ability. Well, then you should should care about this. I do care about this guy. And in the bigger picture, I care about the country. And if I care about the country, then I have to care about the laws. If I don't like the laws, there are ways that I can go about lobbying or petitioning that those laws are changed. In this particular case, I'm not exactly sure where I come down on this. We'll take your calls. 1-800-288-WBAP. 
one 800 9227 the time. Um, he is in the church even as we speak. We'll take your calls next. I'm Rick Roberts. This is the Court of Public Opinion, your voice, your opinion, your attitude on News Talk 820 WBAP. All right, 17 minutes after the hour. Glad you're along. 1-800-288-WBAP. 1-800-288-9227. Well, it, uh, where do I go with this? I mean, it's not the kid's fault. It's not the kid-to-be's fault. It's the fault of the 30-year-old father. Five kids, one with leukemia, pregnant wife. He's been here, I guess he was brought here as a toddler, but for whatever reason, he doesn't fit the criteria for a dreamer. He's been deported twice and both times, <clears throat> came back into the U.S. illegally, and now he's facing deportation again, and he's taken refuge in a Phoenix church. Um, let's get to your calls. Let's go to Louise. Louise, thank you for waiting. Hi. Hey, Rick. So, Rick, I'm going to preface this with saying I'm a naturalized citizen, and um, I normally have very little tolerance for people who are putting illegal immigrants above citizens. Okay, I can, Louise, Louise, I can bear, are you on speakerphone? Yep. Yeah, we, let's, yeah, that's better, thank you. Sorry about that, I was driving a pullover. But I was just going to say, I barely have any tolerance for people who put illegal immigrants above U.S. citizens, uh, given that I'm a naturalized citizen, and I went through the awful process that it is to become a citizen. However, I saw this story this morning, and I said to my husband, this is a story where the spirit of the law needs to take precedent over the letter of the law. I mean, this is a little boy with leukemia. His dad's the only one who can care for him. And I and I don't think this one guy is a big deal, Um and I don't, I don't know. I just feel like that there is a place for mercy in the legal system, and we see it with people all the time. And I think this might be a valid time to exercise mercy rather than legalism. And that's just my two cents. Uh, you know, it's kind of how I looked at it. With all the illegals in this country, uh, for instance, in San Diego, now I broadcasted out of San Diego for a long time. I could fill up 50 metro buses in about a half hour. I mean, they're everywhere. Um, but I don't know whether they've got the same situation as the, this guy has. I mean, uh, has he broken any laws aside from our immigration law, which you and I both know is non-existent? Uh, should he be given um, some extra consideration? Um, as a hardship on the, on the five-year-old, hardship on the pregnant wife. I think they ought to have quit having kids. But, you know, aside from that. That's not for us to say, though. Like, exactly. I with that, too. E- exactly. Yeah, but. But, but then again, um, you know, at some point, I mean, he's broken the law, not once, but a couple of times. Uh, but so, a death law, uh, I, mean, I don't know. I, I just think there is room for individual discretion from a judge, perhaps to give him, I don't know, perhaps a medical visa or something along those lines that allow him to be here legally. Right. Because um, perhaps he didn't realize at a time when there was a window for him to become a, uh, get a green card even, if he's married to a U.S. citizen and that window's closed, he didn't know any better. Now he has to leave the country for 10 years. As someone with a, a family myself, I, I can't comprehend what that would mean for that family. So. I guess my point is, I, I get the law. I generally support uh, U.S. immigration laws being enforced properly, but I do think that we need to not be so legalistic that we don't take certain individual considerations uh, under advisement at times. That's- Louise, I appreciate that. By the way, where are you from originally, Louise? Australia. Australia. Uh, well, welcome, and thank you for doing it the right way. And Luis is, is kind of verbalizing, you know, as I listen to this case, you know, it's not some guy, you know, living in his parents' basement and, you know, not working. And, you know, it's, it's a different situation. And I know there are those people that say the law's the law's the law. Well, <laughs> that's true, but how many other laws uh, do, we, uh, do we look at? Uh, do you see what I'm saying? How many other laws do we uh, do we bend? Um, as a matter of fact, uh, the preacher 
that is, uh, I guess he's a preacher that you know, where I go to church, that's what you call him, the minister, what have you, uh, is going to be with us coming up in about five or six minutes. And we'll find out what he has to say as far as why he is uh, harboring this guy within his church there in Phoenix. Um, all right, let's go to uh, Robert in Fort Worth. Robert, thank you for waiting. How you doing, Robert? Doing well, Rick. Well, I guess I'll be the first bad guy of the day. Uh, what do you mean? What, what do you mean? What do you, what do you mean, bad guy? Well, well, my thought is, you know, the guy's been deported twice. He had a wife here who's apparently a U.S. citizen. Has he ever taken any action to attempt to become legal? See, I don't know. I, I and hopefully I can find out when I talk to the minister coming up here in uh, about five, six, seven minutes or so. Uh, yeah, because there there are a lot of unknowns. Has he tried to get his paperwork in order? Has he? Um, I mean, all that's been reported is that he was deported twice before and twice before he came back to the country illegally. Yeah, and my other qu- question, my other interest would be. Uh, where are they at? Are they on any kind of welfare, food stamps? Does he work all the time? What's the status there? No, but the bottom line, we're a country of laws. And while we might be able to find some sort of compromise, the simple fact is there's a lot of people listening to this conversation right now that have been rear-ended by an illegal that was turned away while they were left there to face the law. I've been in that situation myself for far too long. We've just simply looked the other way. Well, I look, I understand, you know, the traffic situation, uh, the drinking culture and driving culture is much different in Mexico than it is here. You and I both know that. Um, but I'm not aware that he has broken the law at all, except, except coming into this country illegally. Um, uh, you know, I, I just don't know. There's too many unanswered questions. Um, at, at this point, I says he's got to be deported, but they won't go inside a church to get him. You know, this is not the first time this has happened. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, Robert, there are a ton of illegals out there, a ton. Uh, that aren't necessarily married, that don't necessarily work to put food on the table for five kids. Um, I don't know. Should should we give some discretion to this guy? Well, there ought to be some sort of discretion, but I would say that that discretion should be somewhere along the lines of rather than make him go back to his home country to file to become legal, maybe we could give him a period of time to do it from here. But the bottom line is, why haven't we gone through that process? Why haven't we attempted to become legal? He's known he was legal for 30 years. He's known he was illegal for 30 years. He's been deported twice. If I was deported and I was taken away from my family and I was needed so much, I I would have been jumping through hoops to try to figure out what I would have to do to remain here legally going forward. No, I I agree with that. Uh, I agree with that 100%. Uh, it, you know, what has been done? Has anything been done? I will fight to stay here. He's going to fight. He says to stay here. I'm not exactly sure what that, what that means in the sense that, uh, you know, where is he fighting? How is he, uh, on what basis? I don't have DUI. I haven't killed nobody. Uh, it's obvious that, uh, it's obvious that uh, Spanish is still his first language, uh, based on the the interviews I saw. But uh, we will talk to uh, the pastor, the minister of uh, the Phoenix Church, uh, that is uh, allowing him and his five year old to stay inside the church, uh, because if he walks outside, he's going to be arrested and um, and deported. Um, uh, Reverend Ken, uh, I believe it's Heinzelmund. Uh, we'll find out. All right, we'll talk to him next, and um, you know we'll see if uh, if uh, you know Mr. Baronis is there. I'm Rick Roberts. Two twenty-seven. Uh, the time. Your call straight ahead. All right. Two thirty-four. The time. 
Glad you're along broadcasting uh, each and every day, afternoon drive out of Dallas, Fort Worth. And of course, uh, heard coast to coast is toll free wherever you are. We'll take your calls in just a little bit. Um, the church, the Shadow Rock United Church of Christ in Phoenix, Arizona, um, is the site of a lot of news breaking today because of uh, a man and his five year old son that have taken uh, refuge there. Usually ICE, um, it's generally known that ICE will not go into a house of worship to uh, to place someone under arrest. With me is the Reverend uh, that you've been reading about, Reverend Ken Heitzelman. Uh, Reverend, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Okay, guys, let's get him up. Sorry, say again, please. Uh, Reverend, am I saying your name correctly, Heitzelman? Yes, you are. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, and you are the reverend at the uh, Shadow Rock United Church of Christ, correct? I am. Okay. If if I can ask, because we're, we're looking at this, a man that uh, uh, has been deported, I guess, twice before, five children, one with uh, leukemia, and uh, a wife uh, that is, uh, is, is pregnant, as we've read. Uh, he is taken, and this is not the first time I, I'm told, this is not the first time that's um, been going on in your church. Can, what can you tell me? How did you even get involved with this, if I may ask? Uh, absolutely, and thank you for asking. What happened is in June of 2014, the group of activists in Tucson came to us with a man and his uh, family and uh, indicated that they needed more time in order for their attorney to work out an administrative remedy that is a remedy within the system. Sure. But they just needed the time to do that. And so we were uh, willing to do that because we felt it was important to keep the family together and to keep people safe. And that's basically been our role is to allow time for attorneys and their clients to work out an administrative and or legal remedy. Okay, now, see, that makes sense, but that was, what, uh, a couple of years ago? That was a couple of years ago. We've been doing this for about three and a half years. Okay, where does, uh, and of course, I have not spoken with the attorney, but um, does the attorney feel that he has a a, a line of uh, operation in this particular case where he can get some type of administrative um, exception uh, for his deportation? Yeah, the administrative exception that was granted was a uh, humanitarian, humanitarian basis, and uh, it was applied for again, and uh, it was denied, and so now they're appealing that, and again, they just need more time to do that because there is a compelling reason to do this. Uh, as you indicated, his uh, five-year-old son has leukemia, and uh, this man wants to be a good father. He wants to be a provider. And uh, we're trying to help him do that. Okay. You know, there have been a lot of questions from the audience, as I would expect. I've been doing this a while, and uh, I simply don't have the answers. He has been, he's 30 years old. He's been here since a toddler. But he doesn't, for whatever reason, um, qualify um, around the parameters of being a dreamer. Can you tell me why he doesn't qualify for that? You know, that's a good question. I'm going to be looking into what the answer for that is. He just came to our attention as of late Friday afternoon, and so we're trying to figure out what all the parameters are and what are the options and how it fits and doesn't fit. It's, uh, as you know, it's a complicated system. And there are seem to be exceptions, and we're trying to figure that out. Yeah, as I look at this, and and I'm trying to look at it objectively, um, yeah. if he's been here for 30 years, it would it would seem, and he's been deported a couple of times, it would seem on the face of it um, that he perhaps has known that he was in jeopardy. And if he's in jeopardy, obviously his family's in jeopardy because he's the breadwinner. Um, it, it, it has his attorney said, okay, well, we've got, uh, um, you know, a plan or a line of action. I mean, in other way, I believe in God, Jesus Christ and the Holy spirit that works for me. I'm not, I'm not the God hour and I'm not trying to tell anybody else what to do, but in right. you, in your particular case, 
Um, you felt it. You uh, evidently the attorney said something to you that made you feel that well we can do this uh, until uh, what the plan has been exhausted. I mean, at some you can't have somebody living in your church from now on with no end. Uh, surely you've got some some line of reasoning, do you not? I think the line of reasoning is that, uh, and understand, I'm not an attorney either, and we do our best to support the attorneys as they advocate for their clients, and that uh, there are motions that are made, there are appeals, uh, it goes to the uh, Board of Immigration Affairs, it sure. goes to the District Court, you know, and all of that. And I, again, I know those titles, I know those names, but I don't know the ins and outs and of the legalities of it. But as long as the attorney feels that there is a path forward, we want to offer that uh, a time to, uh, you know, do our best to keep the family together. And and also, if they need time to put their affairs together and stay together as a family and move on. If they decide to move on, then of course, you know, they're, they're free to do that. So uh, we're talking with Reverend Ken Heitzelman. He is um, uh, the Reverend where this, uh, this man, this 30 year old man, and I, I guess his five year old son is, is there with him at the shadow rock United church of Christ. And the family has been here. They come and go. They're trying to have as normal of life possible out of their own home and to attend school. Uh, so uh, they've been able to prepare meals together and uh, and be together where uh, there was probably a good chance that would not have happened if he had gone to his check-in appointment this morning. If so, he wanted to. But. No, no, please go ahead. He, he he wanted to comply and he has complied, but things have changed in terms of uh, uh, the kind of enforcement that's taking place. Uh, yeah, I, I think what everybody is wondering if he was brought here as a toddler, I think is what I read, and he's 30 years old now, has five kids and a pregnant wife. Uh, why does he not qualify as a dreamer under under those ramifications? At some point, Reverend, if the attorney says, "Well, we've got no place to go," he's you know he's going to have to take his family and go. Will you allow ICE to come into the church and and take him? Well, I don't think. I, I guess I would. I wouldn't phrase it that way. I think that. Uh, ICE can do whatever they want, whenever they want. Sure. Uh, so, so uh, you know, ICE can. All right. Do we lose the Reverend? Well, let's check one more time. Reverend, are you still with me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. I've got your back. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I guess what I'm saying, historically, ICE has, uh, has not gone into a house of worship and uh, right. arrested someone, uh, at least, I mean, they can, but they yes. have chosen not to in the past. Uh, this doesn't appear that it's going to have a different outcome. Um, but at some point, you were the reverend for an entire congregation, not just one family. At some point, I would think uh, if they decide to, to come in, then you have done just about all you can do, have you not? I think that that would be true. I think that if ICE comes in uh, short, uh, we would stand uh, at the door. We would uh, plead his case. We would do our best to have integrity with the concept of sanctuary. But ICE can forcibly move us. They can forcibly take him. And there's nothing that we could do about that. So, you know, short of that, if the family runs out of administrative remedies, if the attorneys say there's no more for us to do, then we're going to be putting our heads together. We're going to be praying. We're going to be discerning uh, what is what is next. Because I think you you are correct that uh, a person can't live their life separated from their family and, and one in a home and the other in the church. Yeah, I mean, you could look at this, I suppose, and say this really pragmatically speaking is no different than if uh, than if he were to go back to Mexico for a period of time i i suppose it is a bit different but um what but it is it, it it is different and 
the I guess the what I would point out is I understand that it's an immigration it's an immigration issue and there's complexity here and um uh, it's important for us to, as a society to have laws and we have a social contract and we want we want to honor that it keeps us civil I I I get all of that the other thing that we're balancing here is that we've been able to see families celebrate birthdays and Christmases together. They've been able to have meals together. They've been able to support each other in important conversations with children when they were maybe bullied at school or whatever. And uh, we've been able to see one father celebrate his daughter's graduation. He didn't, he wasn't able to attend, but he, they were able to have a piece of cake together and, and give a hug to her to say, good job, you're doing the right thing, and I'm proud of you, and you're going on to school. In other words, they could do all those intangibles that a family is able to do because they're not across the border, but in fact just you know across town. Bottom line, uh, Reverend, it, it, obviously this can't go on forever, but um, have you asked uh, Mr. Baronis, uh, why perhaps he did not try to get his paperwork in order in the last 30 years, and and why did he wait until it came to this? I think that that's a legitimate question. I don't have the answer to that, but the question also assumes that there was a path by which his paperwork could be put in order, and I don't know if that's true or not. I, I think we assume that that's true, but I know that there are many instances when there is not a path forward. And I would hope for comprehensive immigration reform that would allow for that to happen. Uh, we've been talking with Reverend Ken Heitzelman. I know you've got uh, a lot of people to talk to today. I would hope we can talk again. Again, um, you know, my, my main question is, is, after 30 years, was there a path to try and get the paperwork together and why he doesn't qualify if, in fact, he was brought here as a, a toddler and now he's 30 with children of his own? Why does he not qualify uh, for for the so-called Dreamer Act? Um, yeah, good, it's a good question, and I certainly will be uh, looking for that answer as well. And, um, you know, I think I think all of these questions are, are good, and I appreciate the tone of this discussion. Well, I, I mean, look, it, it's when you're talking with children, uh, these children are, are building memories, even as you and I are speaking. And, yeah. you know, the fewer uh, bad memories, the better. Um, but I think also, you know, if we're a nation ruled by law, uh, as opposed to some third world countries, uh, we've, we have to have answers to certain questions before we can rationally come to some conclusion, right? I, I think that's right. And I wish that I had all the answers to every question, uh, both the questions I have and the questions I don't know yet, before I can make a decision. I don't know that anybody has that luxury. So we do the best that we can making those decisions, staying open to the dialogue, open to the questions, and moving forward, doing what we think is the most just and, and compassionate thing or per, with the person that's come to our doorstep. And that's kind of where we are. And I, I, would, I would invite continuing uh, this discussion. Reverend, I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, we will speak with you again, I'm sure. Reverend Ken Heinzelman, he is the Reverend of the church where uh, this uh, this national story is playing itself out. Um, more questions than answers, really, at this point. Reverend, I appreciate your time very much. 2.48 the time. Let's step aside very quickly. Check your afternoon drive, then back with your calls on News Talk 820 WBAP. Uh, 253 the time uh my thanks uh to the reverend uh yeah look he's uh he's pretty much between a rock and a hard place and i get that i understand what's going on uh went long with that segment so i got a break uh, for uh clayton neville in the wbap newsroom if you've been patient enough to hang on uh you will get your day in the court of public opinion and uh, Really, we're faced with, okay, this guy has been deported twice. 
and both times he came back to the country illegally to be with his family, his wife and five kids, and she is pregnant again, I'm told. Uh, he has taken refuge inside the Shadow Rock United Church of Christ. Um, ICE, historically, has been reluctant to go into a house of worship and uh, arrest people and take them away, which, uh, you know, depending on your point of view, I think that's a, a good thing. Um, that should not be a place for that type of thing. Uh, has he broken the law? Yeah, there, there's no doubt. So what do you do with this now? Um, he was asked, uh, Mr. Baronis, Jesus Baronis, he was asked, what do you say to people that uh, say you've broken the law and you must be deported? He said, well, they just don't like our people. They don't like Mexicans, which is not true, obviously. You're either a nation ruled by law or you're a third world banana republic, one or the other. Um, it, it seems to me that with everything that we're dealing with out of out of Washington, and I mean, you know, you can't look in any direction without some upheaval someplace. It appears to me that uh, something probably could be worked out on a humanitarian basis. Um, are you setting a precedent? I don't think so. Not necessarily. So many things are done in the in the name of uh, immigration reform. Um, I, you know, quite honestly, it's a very difficult thing. When you think about it, it's not the kid's fault, certainly. Uh, it's not uh, the five-year-old's fault that has leukemia. It's not the, you know, one thing I would advise Mr. Baronis of, stop having kids. Of course, you know, when you tell someone stop having kids in this country, it's like taking their first unborn male child. Well, I can have as many kids as I want. Yeah, well, that's true. But should you? In this particular case, maybe just stop where you are. Your wife's pregnant again. You got five others. You're 30 years old and you're taking refuge inside a church to keep from getting deported. What should happen to this guy? Your call straight ahead. I'm Rick Roberts, News Talk, 820 WBAP. Oh, it's the Rick Roberts Show on 820 AM, 99.5 FM, HD2, News Talk, 820 WBAP. Well, I know there's got to be. A few hundred million more like me Just trying to keep it free yeah. Rick Roberts starts Rick Roberts starts right now Four minutes after the hour Glad you're along You have been very, very patient Lines are full As you hear someone drop off You can jump in there um, and I promise you, if uh, you were patient enough to hang on, you would get your day in the court of public opinion. This is Debbie, Debbie in Flower Mound. Debbie, thanks for waiting. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Rick? I'm well, thank you. I've got several points I'm going to make, and I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> First of all, I listened to the interview with the pastor. It's obvious this man is a sincere Christian man who's taken on something without even having all the information. I am concerned that that is a t taking advantage of the human spirit of the religious community, um, and he's trusting, and there's a lot of questions with that. The other thing is, is first of all, I do not believe that we should keep him here. He's been deported twice. There's a reason he was deported, and there's a reason why he hasn't taken steps to become a citizen. So I suspect that this is a welfare situation. Um, if he wants to keep his family together, he can take them to Mexico and create his family life in the state that he was uh, a citizen of. Um, he's known this for years. Based by his speech, he hasn't integrated well into the English language language. I'm getting feedback on my phone, so I'm sorry if I'm stumbling here. No, that's that's fine. I can hear you the, fine. The other problem that I have was his statement that you've been kind of feeding in between, where he said he was going to fight and that we don't like Mexicans. Uh, I'm, I'm indignant at that comment. 
And how about he show a little humbleness towards the kindness and generosity of our country? I am really getting tired of that. We, we are Christian. We don't like to hear these human stories. We generally step up and support these kind of human stories amongst us. So don't tell me that crap. I, you know, as I heard him say that, um, uh, you know, I I have to be honest with you. It, it, I could be wrong, but it, it appeared to me as though Mr. Baronis was not extremely educated for for someone to say well if people want me to leave they don't like mexicans and you know that doesn't come from a place of being educated that comes from uh really a a child you you don't do you know what i'm saying uh it's it's a militant it's a militant stance yeah it 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 doesn't it doesn't sound to me that maybe Mr. Baronis is, is highly educated and perhaps he was struggling for something to say. I don't know. Um, but that's, you know, that's a... But we don't make, you know, in defense of that, we don't make that a priority. But I will say, you can be very poor. Many of our forefathers came here very poor. But the fact of the matter is, is this militantness is what's really just grinds us the wrong way. Well, I think think the fact that you're you're taking refuge in a house of worship, um, so that the you know ICE will not deport you. I think that in itself, uh, you know, demonstrates some militant behavior, don't you? Well, I do, I do, but I do understand the the pastor's position. But yes, I do. I think it's cowardly. I think go home, get your crap together like the rest of us have to do. Do what you need to do. Do the paperwork. If you can afford an attorney or if an attorney is doing pro, pro work for you, then that's fine. That it's obvious to me that the attorney is not doing work to get him citizenship. Well, I did. Here I, legally. I did ask, Debbie. I did ask to speak to the attorney, and the attorney simply didn't want to talk. Uh, and that's his prerogative. Nobody has to talk to me on the radio. Um, but uh, there's some very glaring questions um, that I think should be answered. And, and you know, I appreciate even CBS, uh, you know, asking some very direct questions, which they don't usually do. Uh, but uh, why does he not uh, qualify as a dreamer if he was brought here as a toddler? Uh, did he miss that window of opportunity? I don't know. Um, you know, what, uh, what is going on with his family from a humanitarian standpoint? Um, you know, we, I suppose we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, I agree with you, Debbie. I think the, uh, the Reverend, uh, Holstein was, uh, you know, very, very, uh, sincere. I, I think he is, uh, if he's a Reverend, he's weighing, uh, God's law between man's law and, and, you know, we're directed to follow both. But I think he was sincere. I think he was very credible and he understood the questions, um, that we wanted answered. And, and here's the thing. Anytime something like this happens, then you start to build precedent for, for other cases. Debbie, I appreciate the call very, very much. Let's go to Bill in Dallas. Bill, thanks for waiting. How you doing, Bill? Terrific. Yeah. Having, having a good day. Good. Even though it's kind of cold, but anyway. Um, yeah. Okay, let me see right here. Immig- all immigrants, I think they should take a test as a requirement for uh, attempted citizenship to our country. And they should make them sing the national anthem. <laughs> and, well, there there is a test required, Bill. There's, you know, for citi- a citizenship test. As a matter of fact, we do it a couple times a year on the air here just to see how many citizens can actually pass it. Um, as far as singing the national anthem, I, I don't know whether that's a requirement or not. I don't know what that, I mean, I understand it's important. And if you're a citizen... Um, you should view it as important. And with, uh, you know, the climate of everybody protesting everything, you know, I thought about that this weekend. Uh, Can you think of one thing that hasn't been protested this past year? Bill, thank you for the call. Let's go to Cheryl. Cheryl in Fort Worth. Cheryl, thanks for waiting. Hi. uh, I've been listening to this argument uh, and I listened to the pastor and everything. And and my my grandfather uh, came here from England uh, he was here for two years, and it took five years for him to become a U.S. citizen. 
And the idea that somebody can just break into our country and be able to stay here, I mean, I'm sorry that the man's parents uh, did what they did to him, but that's the parents' fault, not ours. And uh, I also have a severely, or did, have a severely mentally and physically disabled child, uh, didn't walk, didn't talk, didn't feed herself or diapers her entire life. And uh, I'm just wondering how many special needs kids and families, you know, have to, uh, you know, lose their lives or can't get into an emergency room because of an illegal alien, illegal, illegal criminal alien being here. And uh, how many kids can't get the education they need because of an illegal criminal alien taking up space? Uh, and and my my husband's car just got T-boned the other day. It cost us thirty five thousand dollars to go out and buy a new car because you know probably a year or so early because the guy the person the woman rather uh, who was supposedly pregnant a young teenager supposedly uh, that didn't have any a driver's license didn't have a uh, any insurance. And, you know, I'm sick and tired of having to pay for people being here illegally when my grandfathers, both of them, did it the right way. And, and I'm sick of it. I am sick of it. We need to enforce the dead gun laws, and we need to repeal the Hart Seller Act, H-A-R-T hyphen, or I mean, uh, dash seller, C-E-L-L-A-R, and uh, make it so that you have to have a sponsor to come here. You have to have uh, skills before you get here. You have to have no diseases. I mean, how many of these people that are breaking into our country are screened for diseases? Absolutely zero. And it's causing us to have things like, you know, tuberculosis again when we've had it wiped out. It's, no, it's, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Account, and the parents, or the parents are at fault, and I'm sorry the parents chose that for their family, but they need to vote. They need to go. All right. I appreciate it, Debbie. Uh, thank you. Or excuse me. Was that Debbie? No, that was Cheryl. Cheryl, forgive me. Um, I appreciate the call. I appreciate the passion. Sounds like uh, you've had a head of, heck of a week um, at the hands of illegal immigration. Uh, I hope uh, you get through it okay. 313 the time. Your call straight ahead in the court of public opinion. All right, 319 the time. This is David. David, thank you for waiting. I appreciate your patience. How you doing? Wonderful. Better than I deserve, as Brother Dave would say. I love your program Thank because you. I hear so many voices who are echoing the thoughts in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And, you know, whenever you are standing in line at an event, you do not like people coming and butting ahead of you, do you? Okay, say that again, David, because I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Whenever you are waiting in a line to buy a ticket to a sporting event or in the grocery store or wherever, you do not like it whenever someone comes and butts in line without permission. True. Now, Joe Kennedy the other night in the Democrat response to the great State of the Union message said, let Trump build the wall. Our, my generation will tear it down. Well, he forgot to mention that all of the Kennedy compounds have walls around them. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, I uh, I listened to the uh, Democrat rebuttal, uh, I, such as it was, or the Democrat response to the State of the Union. Um, yeah, the Joe Kennedy was a delusional mess. Uh, there was no line of thinking. There was. I, you got me. I don't know where he was going with it. Um, we we have to control our borders. You know, in this particular case, you got a guy and his five year old sitting in a church. Um, you know, I I really really I tried. I really tried to get his attorney to come on, which was, what are you doing? I mean, what what course of action do you think you've got? Um, David, good call. I appreciate it. Greg in Arlington. Greg, thanks for waiting. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Good. Hey, I uh, just want to make a couple of points here. Um, in the, the, the majority of the Im illegal immigrants that come here, to me, that is a self-inflicted wound. You don't have to do that. You know, this is just something you wanted. That's something you chose to do. But when you break in someone's country, you shouldn't have you know, rights or any uh, expectations of how that country treats you or, you know, what they have in store for you. And, again, let's talk about if you have to deport this guy, you're sending him home. 
Mexico is not a country that's under fire. They're, they're not at war with anyone. You know, it makes it, part of Mexico is a vacation uh, destination. So, you know, again, this is just going to something that you want to do. But if you want to do it, do it the right way. The United States government, we're not the enemy here in this situation because we didn't make you come over here. You cho- You put your family in this situation by the decisions that you made. We should not have to be, as citizens, we shouldn't have to pay for your decisions that you that you put your your, your family into. I want to I want to challenge I want to challenge all your listeners. If you really want to see how uh, illegal immigration is affecting affecting our country and our in our our in our state, I challenge go to Parkland Hospital, or go to uh, the the county hospital in in, in Fort Worth, uh, John Peter Smith. Ninety percent of the patients in the ER, they're they're Spanish. They're from Mexico. They don't speak English. Now, let's take let let let's do let's do this real quick exercise. If we were to pull out every drug addicted person out of the ER system in our country, wouldn't our ER rooms and our hospitals be able to operate a whole lot more efficiently if we could pull out those the the, the folks that are doing drugs? and harming themselves, again, a self-inflicted wound. Because your caller did uh, a couple of callers ago said that these, these aliens are in the hospital. They're taking beds away from legitimate people that really need help that are taxpayers. So my point is, if we pull these folks out of our country that are putting a drain on our, on our local government, on our federal government, we as a country, we could operate and help the needy of the needy United States citizen first. That's my that's my take on it. All right, let me let me ask you a question because I agree with most of what you said, Greg. Uh, should ICE um, obtain the warrant, walk in the front door of the church, arrest this guy, and take him out? You don't need a warrant to go in there and get it. Yes, you, you, you do. It, you, well, Greg, what? listen, you do. Go ahead. He they yeah. have to have a warrant to go inside the church, arrest the guy, and take him out. My question is, should they do that? Yes, they should, and I'll tell you why. The The Bible says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. In other words, we as Christians, we're supposed to follow man's law. That pastor of that local church is impeding this investigation or impeding justice. If we're supposed to deport him, that pastor shouldn't be a buffer between between the United States government and that person being, you know, that's lodged in that in that in that church. That pastor should willingly obey man's law, turn that man over, and try to help him behind the scenes. But he should not be impeding this process at all. When he does, he's overstepping his authority as a man of God. All right. I appreciate the call, Greg, very much. 325 the time. Clayton Neville, he's uh, standing by with the very latest breaking news. We'll check your afternoon drive as well. And back with your calls. Uh, You know, as I look at this, you know, Greg made a lot of sense. He he made a lot of sense. Um, And that's why I asked the preacher, um, would he stand in the doorway? And he said, yeah, but if they come in, then, you know, I, they can do whatever they want. I've got to step aside. Um, you know, the, the Reverend, uh, you know, this is kind of a no win situation for him is the way I see it. Um, it seems to me that, uh, Mr. Baronis, Jesus Baronis, um, probably shouldn't be putting anybody in that situation. Uh, it's his situation. He should, uh, you know, figure out how he should uh, deal with this. Um, I, this is not the first time it's happened. Somebody seeking refuge in a church to keep from being deported. As a matter of fact, it's not even the first time for this particular church. All right, three twenty-six. The time your call straight ahead. <laughs> prosecuted he should be lifted up used as an example of what it means to be a father uh, he shouldn't be prosecuted he should be lifted up 
as an example of uh, what it is to be a father. My wife cannot give him the pills because she's pregnant. Okay. I, uh, a lot of an, uh, unanswered questions here. Obviously, the reverend that we just spoke with, the reverend of this church where this illegal has taken refuge with his five-year-old, uh, I, maybe maybe giving, I, I, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't. I want to be fair. I want to be fair. He's been here 30 years. Has he ever tried to get his paperwork in order? He's got five kids, another one on the way. He's 30 years old. Um, the five-year-old is staying with him in this church in Phoenix. ICE has refused to get a warrant and go in as they have historically, and I think that's good. I, I don't think uh, I don't think a, a church or a temple or a place of worship is you know the appropriate venue for something like this. Uh, but the question is, what should this guy be doing on his own? Uh, Tom in Fort Worth. Tom, thanks for waiting. I appreciate it. Hi, Tom. Hi, Rick. I hope you're having a great afternoon. I am indeed. Thank you. Well, I've, I've got an observation, and that is every problem and every situation has money as a component. And for every solution, it typically costs money. Now, a lot of these foreign nationals, and that's the correct terminology to refer to these people, regardless of whether they're here from China, Nicaragua, Brazil, or Mexico, they're foreign nationals. And what has occurred over the last 10 or 15 years least in their countries of origin. So what I would like to see is a 10% surcharge or export tariff on all U.S. currency wire transfers. Then you allocate that money, and most years it's going to be between 3 and $5 billion. You put that money into a fund, and the money could be uh, allocated to the border states to offset prison and jail expenses, emergency room costs associated with all these foreign no, I, I, Look, I, that's not a bad idea. What about this particular case that we're discussing today? Well, if we had that fund of money available, there could be an emergency pool that would allocate and expedite fast legal response, and it could also pay for immigration courts so that you'd have judges working around the clock expediting getting these cases heard, and the sooner action is taking place, that's going to have an effect on reducing the desire of foreign nationals to stay underground. They're going to come to the surface, and there'll be money there for the solution of the problem. No, I got you. I got you. That's, that's not a half bad idea. I mean, you'd have to uh, you'd have to go to every uh, Western Union <laughs> Western Union uh, in the, in America to deal with that. But I, I get it. I understand. Let me give you just a few things that came in via the email during that last news break. Uh, this is from Jay Rick. We're a Christian. Uh, we are Christian. Compassion comes first. Let him stay. Take care of his family. You really think Jesus would deport him? Um, no, probably not. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that we're either a nation ruled by law uh, or we're not. But there's it seems to me there's got to be some gray area there. Uh, exceptions to every rule. There, there are every other way. Another email, Rick, he must have had a great job to support that many kids. Um, another email from Dave, Rick, with all due respect, as long as there, one, as there is one vet out there that needs help or shelter, then I will offer no help to those that have broken the law to get here. This minister should consider helping those that need help that served our country before sheltering lawbreakers. And, you know, I have said that. And time and time again, at the point of being redundant, I'm sure, you know, don't talk to me about we need to take more refugees from Syria and this place and that place until no vet sleeping under a bridge or standing in line at a soup kitchen or a family's not living on food stamps. You know, they upheld their end of the contract. Um, the government didn't. Um, let's uh, another. Uh, this was uh, who's this from? I uh, don't have the name. Rick. Uh, you can apply for a green card if you are married to an American citizen. Adjustment of status means becoming a lawful permanent resident 
and getting your green card, the main way to adjust status in the immigration court if you are married to a U.S. citizen, have a U.S. citizen child, 21 years of age or older, or have a U.S. citizen parent. Um, and, I mean, literally, it goes on and on and on. Uh, let's go to uh, Mary in Plano. Mary, thank you for waiting. Hi, Mary. Thank you, Rick. Uh, you are so kind and so uh, empathetic, um, and I'm referring to your interview with the, the minister. I just don't know that I could have been that gracious uh, because this situation really, really just makes me livid. I am taxpayer, taxpaying a Christian American of Hispanic background, uh, it, and we as children growing up are taught to obey the laws here. Uh, this man that that is in this situation, he was deported more than once. After the first time, he knew he had broken the law, right. did nothing to correct that. And now he continues to to stay here, and 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 just prey on our sympathies, on our empathies. Well, I've had it. This man needs to be deported. And forgive me, I am a Christian person, but I think that minister ought to be slapped with a fine, a big fine, because this is what's going on. People like this minister and others like him keep making excuses for these these illegals i'm sorry you're breaking our laws they need to get it and by being allowing them you're enabling these people to continue breaking the law i I, i'm just i'm just livid i i just don't think that he should be allowed to stay here i'm sorry no I, i i i understand what you're saying mary and you know, someone said, uh, you know, that that preacher you should have got uh, the Rick Roberts treatment. Well, look, um, I, I'm hoping to talk to this guy's attorney. And my uh, my way of doing that is through the minister. I mean, I could I could ream this guy up one side and down the other. What's that yeah. solve? That doesn't solve anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. you have to pick your fights in this world, and that's not a fight worth picking, at least not with him. You know, the other thing that just really uh, upsets me to no end, where is Mexico and the government of Mexico in all this? They should step up and take some responsibility. Why are they making we Americans to be the uncaring, uh, unsympathetic people? We, and you've said it over and over, we are the most generous, giving nation in the world there is no way that they can they can put that on us to make us feel like we're we're just being uh mean we're not i mean we have got laws we need to get our house in order and it's time that everyone understands that no i i don't disagree with you uh, your question as to mexico uh back in 2010 or 2009 i i forgive me mary i forget which uh, the second largest source of income going into Mexico were Mexican nationals working outside Mexico, primarily in the U.S., sending money back in, which I've never understood because Mexico is so rich in natural resources, oil and natural gas and other things. Um, you know, it's, it's in San Diego, you would have hundreds upon hundreds of illegals living in the canyon, specifically to Colte Canyon and other places. Um, and you know, the, the bleeding heart liberals would say, oh my God, let's take them this, let's take them that. Uh, they're homeless. They're not homeless. Most of them had homes just in Mexico. They were here, um, you know, picking produce up and down the coast and sending all the money back. Um, as far as the government of Mexico, uh, they print out pamphlets, uh, for people that are trying to come here illegally to show them where the safe houses and other things are, they don't recognize the border. And most of the uh, Hispanic uh, uh, groups like uh, 
Oh, gosh, you know, pick one. Uh, they believe that most of California, part of Texas, uh, they believe, the, you know, that to be part of Mexico. And the government doesn't dissuade them from that belief. So you're never going to get any help from Mexico because it's a source of income for them. Uh, Mary, very good call. I appreciate it. Let's go to, uh, where am I going? Uh, let's go to uh, Jay in Plano. Jay, thank you for waiting. Hi, Jay. Hey, Rick, how are you? Very good. Listen, I just was calling this. I just feel like, you know, this whole afternoon, the show's been kind of wasted talking about illegal aliens when we could be talking about U.S. citizens. You know, you spent almost, what, three hours now on the show just talking about all that. You know, we seem to do that a lot. We well, what, Jay, hey, hey, what, what are you talking about? Well, you're talking about one particular case of one. I'm talking general. about the sovereignty, security uh, of a nation, which happens to be the United States of America. What do you want to talk about, Jay? Well, what I think we, we don't talk about enough is, you know, putting the fire up against the politicians and saying, hey, listen. I talk about that every day. Where have you been? I'm listening to you almost every day. Okay, uh, well, then you know exactly what I do every day. Holding people accountable, comp uh, campaign finance reform, term limits, you know, who needs uh, to go. Uh, what do you, what do you talk? This is important to us. If, in fact, we're going to remain a sovereign nation, if we're going to be a secure nation, uh, we got to come up with some, some way to deal with illegal immigrants. Otherwise, we're the doorstep for America. Do you not see that? No, I agree. We do have lots of rules. Unfortunately, they're not been enforced. And also, we keep trying to make exceptions like you are right now. I'm and making, I'm making, wait a minute, Jay. What? I'm making exceptions to what? To this one particular case. That I have not made an, this an exception. I defy you to come in the studio, go through the through the uh, the tapes and find one area where I've made an exception. I've been asking the question because I'm looking for answers. Okay. All right. I just feel we spent a lot of time on that. Unfortunately, you know, people from other countries. Where are you from, from, Jay? Originally from India. You're originally from India. Okay. Well, and if I were doing a, a talk show in India, time, what would my topic today be if I were in India? What? What would my topic be today if I were in India? I'm not sure. I haven't lived there in 30 years. I don't know what the topic would be. Okay. All right. So what should the topic today be, Jay? Well, I'm just saying I think you've spent enough time on this one topic. Why don't we ever talk about the politicians who, you know, they pass Obamacare and they're not in it. They have they pass Social Security. They're not Jay, in it. you don't listen to my show or you wouldn't ask that question. I talk about that stuff every single day. We've got an illegal immigrant. If we're, if we're going to enforce laws, we need to enforce laws. If we're going to make exceptions to the rule, uh, trust me, there are 10 million right behind this guy. It's important right. to come to terms with this. Otherwise, we're going to be overrun with it. Rick, we're already overwhelmed with it, my friend. Okay, we're well, the difference well. between you and I, Jay, is you, you have given up. I have not given up. Do you hear that? I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on the country. Brilliant, brilliant retort. All right, 3.51 the time. This is Ike in Temple, Texas. Ike, thank you for your patience. Hey, no problem. I'm enjoying your, your show. It's a real interesting show, and it's got me on my feet. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. <laughs> no, listen, what I called about is, uh, you know, one, one of the things that, that people don't realize, you know, they talk about gateway drugs. Well, illegal entry the way I see it, is a gateway crime. They come into this United States illegally, and they don't care about any of our crimes. They don't care about driving without driver's licenses. You know, they're just all the way. They don't need insurance. Uh, they, they, think, they think medical is free. And this is, a, you know, these are quotes from uh, uh, illegals that have, that have told me this. And, uh, but, but, you know, he hit the nail on the head with the lady about what Mexico has done. Uh, Mexico is teaching right now and has been for years, reconquista, reconquer. They want to nullify 
the Treaty of Guadalupe that got us out of Mexico City, you know, Mexico-American War. Yeah. And, that, you know, they're teaching. They've been teaching that their schools. These are young soldiers they're sending over. You know, just like the Nazis thought they had the right to go into Poland to protect the Germans that were living there, and, and uh, the Russians went into Georgia because to protect the Russians living in Georgia, guess what? The stage is being set right now as we speak. But you've had some great calls. Well, it's, you know, I, I did this the other day. Well, it's been a month or so ago. The Mexico's immigration law. Um, I'll take that. I'll take that. The Mexican government will bar foreigners if they, and it's kind of odd, if they upset the equilibrium of the national demographic. How's that for racial and ethnic profiling? Uh, if outsiders do not enhance Mexico's economic or nation, national interest or are not found to be physically or mentally healthy, they're not welcome in Mexico. Neither are those who show contempt against national sovereignty or security. They must not be economic burdens on society. They must have clean criminal histories. Those trying to obtain Mexican citizenship have to show a birth certi uh, certificate, provide a bank statement, uh, proving economic independence, pass an exam, prove they can provide their own health care. This is if you want to be a citizen of Mexico. A legal entry into the country is not a felony, but it's punished as, as such. Uh, up to two years imprisonment. Document fraud is subject to a fine and imprisonment. So is alien marriage fraud. Evading deportation in Mexico is a serious crime. Illegal re-entry after deportation is punishable by 10 years imprisonment. Foreigners may be kicked out of the country without due process and the endless bites at the uh, litigation apple uh, that illegal aliens are afforded in America. A fugitive from deportation for eight years who is awaiting a second decision on her previously rejected asylum claim, yeah, that happens in Mexico, or that happens in America, not Mexico. Law enforcement officials at all levels, by national mandate, must cooperate to enforce immigration laws, including illegal alien arrest, deportation. The Mexican military is also required to assist. Native-born Mexicans are empowered to make citizens arrest of illegals and turn them into authorities. Ready to show your papers? Mexico's National Catalog of Foreigners tracks everyone outside tur tourists and for, uh, foreign nationals. A national population registry, uh, registry tracks and verifies the identity of every member, um, and it gets worse. Yeah, but they're going to sit there and take us to school on what we should be doing when it comes to illegal immigrants. News Talk 820 WBAP. I know there's got to be a few hundred million more like me just trying to keep it free. Roberts starts. Rick Roberts starts right now. All right, four minutes after the hour. Uh, when I first saw this story, I thought to myself, well, of course it's California. Where else? You know, but the problem is, is that other states, for whatever reason, follow California's lead more often than not. California could be the first state to set a minimum age requirement for tackle football. You know, it's fueled, of course, by the growing concerns over head injuries in football. Uh, a pair of California lawmakers, they want to take the pop out of uh, Pop Warner football, introducing a bill that could make the state the first to ban tackle football for kids until they reach high school. And I'm thinking to myself, what? Now, some of you as parents, you've got a son that's that's played ball. My son did from third grade on. Um, graduated uh, 26th in the nation, 6th in the state, Division 6A middle linebacker. He was a quarterback for a long, long time. Um, 
left-handed. So the Marlins, Phillies, and Yankees all said they'd take him out of high school. And I said, no, 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 no. Got to go to college. And of course, then his mom died and he didn't want to do much of anything. But you know, yes, I've I've dealt with concussions. As a matter of fact, Sam Bradford, uh, Vikings quarterback. Uh, when Sam was at Putnam North, um, my son played, I think it was twice in, in one year. And he and Sam were friends, but um, in one game, they knocked each other out. Um, they took Sam off in a gator, and uh, my son was able to walk off, but he wouldn't be able to come back in the game. Um, so yeah, I know a little bit about concussions and yeah, they're serious and, and, um, there are things that you take into consideration before you let your kid play, you know, contact football and the helmets have changed significantly, uh, over the years as well. Um, the proposal has outraged a lot of parents and coaches who said their sport is being unfairly singled out in, um, they said what they see is a nanny state run amok. And I'm kind of in agreement. I mean, you have the option. Uh, you know, I, I won't lie. I tried to push my son towards baseball. Um, I thought it was more lucrative. And, you know, he's left-handed, big kid. And so I thought he had more opportunities. But, you know, he wanted to play both. So he played both. And, uh, yeah, we talked about it. I mean, we talked about concussions and concussion protocol and that kind of thing. You know, his, not a problem, but his uh, situation was he was never in, I think he rolled an ankle one time. That was it. Uh, from third grade, third grade until graduation. So he's very fortunate. Um, state assembly members, Kevin McCarthy out of San, Sacramento, a Democrat, and Lorena Gonzalez Fletcher, also a Democrat out of San Diego, said their Safe Youth Football Act would prevent young athletes from sustaining long term brain damage caused by repetitive tackling, hitting, and blocking. Well, if you're going to do that, just don't play football. I mean, the Super Bowl may be over, but the risk of brain injury to kids who play tackle football remains, according to McCarthy. Uh, we have an obligation to protect children from dangerous long-term injuries resulting from tackle football, especially brain trauma. Well, I would say give me the stats for the entire nation. Uh, the bill would be considered this spring. Similar legislation has been proposed in Illinois, Maryland, New York. If uh, If it's passed... California would be the first state in the nation to set a minimum minimum age requirement for youth tackle football. Now, I don't know how many of you, like I said, have boys that play football, but, you know, starting in third grade for a while, it's just a bunch of kids running around, rolling around on the grass. I mean, there's, you know, no big hits. Now, granted, after they get to, to high school, you know, I've seen some devastating hits. I mean, they uh, uh, they're bad. But the bill would affect thousands of families throughout the state. Um, Pop Warner has, has more than, I think, almost 7,000, 7,500 participants, ages 5 to 15. And that's just in the Bay Area alone in California. Um, Natasha Botera, whose 16-year-old son, Luke, has been playing tackle football for eight years is now a quarterback at San Mateo Sierra High School, said the law is kind of ridiculous. Like many things in society, you try to manage something so carefully, you take away what's enjoyable. A parent letting a child play tackle football is no different than letting them go skiing down a mountain. I know kids on baseball teams, they get hurt more than, than football. And, you know, my son's been hit a couple times. Um, he's a pitcher, but... Still, I mean, there are opportunities uh, at bat and other places to get hit. You know, this proposed law came amid growing concern about long-term health effects from head injuries and scrutiny of football safety. I, my son had a couple of concussions during his uh, years playing, and they always take your helmet and hide your helmet because, you know, when you get you get beamed, you goofy, and the first thing you want to do is get back out there, and you can't find your helmet, so. Um, you know, I, I think everything that can be done 
should be done to keep kids safe. That's why there's different helmets now, um, you know, different uh, the different rule changes. Um, you know, the proposed law came because a lot of people were complaining. The scrutiny over football safety. The National Football League agreed to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to former players who said it hid concussion dangers from them. A class action lawsuit was filed against Pop Warner. That's the nation's largest youth football league. This was just, what, two, two years ago? Claimed it jeopardized players by ignoring head injury risks. Um, you know, I know a lot of coaches and a lot of players. You know, Sam Bradford, for instance, when he was, like I said, he and my son were friends, he was always injured. Oh, primarily shoulder injuries. But the lawmaker said that numerous studies have shown that chronic traumatic, uh, traumatic and uh, head injuries uh, caused by repetitive impacts on the head sustained over a period of time, children who play contact sports during their most critical years of brain development uh, face greater risk. Well, I'm sure they do. I'm, I'm sure they do. Um, you know, but you don't put a 150-pound lineman against a 85-pound safety. I mean, there are certain things that, you know, people, uh, all of our kids, have taken if they play ball, have taken numerous hits, and most of them never had a concussion. Um, uh, you know, we'd, uh, it, it's it just typical, I think, isn't it? Uh, California was the first. Illinois is looking at it. New York's looking at it. Um, you know, I, a, a minimum age requirement for tackle football. What or they play flag football until uh, they're a freshman in high school? Is that the way it works? Evidently, um, we'll uh, we'll take your calls on this. One eight hundred two eight eight WBAP. One eight hundred two eight eight nine two two seven. Your calls straight ahead in the court of public opinion. Seventeen minutes after the hour, four seventeen the time. Let's get to your calls. California would be the uh, the first state in the country to uh, ban tackle football until you get to high school. Uh, they think it's uh, better to do to not risk injury. Uh, let's go to uh, Weston. Weston, thanks for waiting. How you doing, Weston? I'm doing pretty good, Rick. How about yourself? I'm doing good, thanks. Good. Um, well, Rick, I, I kind of have to agree in, uh, with California just a little. Um, I didn't start playing football until I was in sixth grade, and I played up. And the reason being is because my stepdad was my head football coach. Uh, he came into my life right around when I was about three, four years old. So I grew up with football. Football was life. Uh, he grew me to be a football player. Um, and the reason why he didn't want me playing football until I got into middle school is because he didn't want me being taught the wrong techniques and wanted me to, to learn from him. Uh, and I, I thank him for that because now when I look back and I watch these videos of parents and stuff arguing over the dumbest things, uh, but this, a kid that's six years old running around not having a clue what he's doing except lowering his head and putting a hit on another kid his age could cause some damage. Um, yes, at that age, their their bodies are able to take impact a little bit better than, say, a, a 40-year-old man like Tom Brady. Uh, now, saying that, that I believe that we – we can't coddle our children. We can't just say, hey, we got to wrap them in bubble wrap and say, no, don't do that. You're going to get a scratch. Or, hey, you're going to get a bump on the head. You're, you can't do that. No, I, I think full contact is the only way a kid is going to be able to learn, but I also think that it's the number one way they're going to get hurt significantly, uh, if, you, if that if, makes any sense. No, it does. But, again... Um, if you start playing, you know, in third or fourth grade, I mean, literally, 
Uh, I'm more worried about him falling off the bed, jumping on the mattress. I mean, it's just a bunch of kids, pretty much the same size, and they're rolling around on the grass. Nobody's really... Um, I know there was a... They had an edition on Friday night called Hit of the Week. And for some reason, my son always seemed to be on that. And yeah, you take a guy that's six foot four and probably 240 running at full speed on a kickoff return, that can cause some damage. Um, and, you know, I talk to coaches about that. But, you know, if you're going age appropriate and size appropriate, um, you know, it's the kids are, are generally, uh, you know, they they know what they're doing. But by the same token, you need good coaches. You need very, very good coaches. You don't put, uh, you know, a lineman against a kid half his size. You don't do that kind of stuff. Um, it just seems to me another another way that we're trying to insulate our kids. Um, if you play full contact sports, you're probably going to have an injury from time to time, right? Yes, sir. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I just, uh, well, I had an experience in college. I, I actually went to college to play football, and I uh, was recruited to be an inside linebacker, which I weighed a buck ninety five on a good day. Uh, and the coach came up to me and said, "Hey, I need you to be a D end." I said, "Okay, uh, yes, sir. Whatever the team needs." Well, I was one hundred ninety five pounds, nineteen years old, going up against a kid that was. Six six, three hundred and twenty pounds, just getting thrown around like a rag doll. Well, that's now, that's that's bad coaching. Absolutely no, and I, I yes, and that's that's where I'm taking my point is that, uh, and no offense to dads that coach football. I, I want once I have a son myself, I want to coach him in football. But you know, there are dads out there that that do stupid things like that. Oh, you're, and, look, there are parents out there that lose their ever-loving minds every time there's yeah. a baseball game or a football game. You know, they're living vicariously through their kids in some cases. Um, it, it It's bad for the kids, it's bad for the game, and it's bad for the other parents. Um, you just have to have, to have people um, that will say, okay, that's enough, sit down. Uh, this guy is, uh, uh, you know, a buck 80 going up against a 250 pound line. No, we're not doing that. Somebody's going to get hurt. Exactly. No, and that, like I said, I'm all about full contact and I hate what they've done with the NFL and, uh, everything else. I just, you know, we got, we got dads out there that push kids too far. Um, and that's why I, I thank my stepdad every day that I'm able to talk to him that, you know, uh, Thanks for making me wait until I was in middle school um, and letting me get a head on my shoulders before he sticks me out there and says, hey, go wild, go hit somebody. Yeah, well, you don't you, you don't want to do that ever, ever. I mean, everything should be controlled. And even when, you know, you, you hammer that home, uh, control, 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 there are still going to be some hits that are outside uh, outside those parameters. Uh, I'm, Weston, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, good for you. Bob in Cedar Hill. Bob, thanks for waiting. Hi, Bob. Hey. Hi, Rick. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Hey, Rick, I was listening to your last caller, and probably like a lot of the people who are going to be calling in for the next 20 minutes have all, uh, you know, probably played football and had a pretty good experience with it. And um, I guess I guess the reason I called was I was telling your screener, Really, um, I don't trust the Democrats as far as I can throw them when it comes to how they want to go about doing this. And I don't know if you feel the same way about that. Uh, I, you know, anytime politics get in, in, gets involved with something, uh, that's a red flag for me. Um, you know, I, I don't want to see uh, football players out on the field, sitting in a circle, uh, holding hands, eating Twinkies. Uh, you know, it's, it's I, I just don't, you know, there are some things where Democrats need to be left out. This is probably one. Absolutely. And I, I one other, one other question for you too, Rick, was I also thought too about how this impacts our younger kids, because I'm, I'm a school teacher and I realize watching uh, my kids, I, I teach elementary school, so I see a, a lot of boys, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, sure, that sure. use that use football as a way to let out some of that controlled aggression. You know, there may be things going on at their home. There may be things how they're doing at school, and this is a way for them to sort of let off some steam and also, you know, be successful at something. And 
what I worry about is, you know, if we try to control it through politics, like you're saying, what happens to a lot of these kids who might not get the opportunity to play football? Well, I'll, I'll be very, very blunt with you and open and honest. The biggest problem I had uh, with my son playing uh, baseball and football was getting him educated because it didn't matter what his grades were. The coaches were going to get with his teachers on Friday and make sure he was cleared to play Friday night, um, which is fine for them. But what happens if he breaks that left arm? I mean, um, it, the, the, the toughest thing for me was just trying to, uh, to get him educated because he only went to school to play ball. He's the polar opposite of his sister. Um, which is usually the case in a family, but, um, it was, I finally got to the point, look, if he doesn't pass, you know, he's not playing and I get these saucer like eyes. Well, he's going to get picked up by so-and-so. I don't care about that. If he comes home and falls down and breaks that left arm or can't run and hit anymore, um, you guys going to take him to raise? I don't think so. He needs to pass. Uh, so, so as a teacher, I hope, uh, you keep that, uh, forefront. Oh, absolutely. And, and I think um, I think just one of the things is I just in my mind and thinking, you know, that can be one way that we can kind of keep these kids in school, keep them on the straight and narrow is their desire to want to play a sport, even if it's exactly. baseball or anything else. Exactly. You want to play on Friday night, you better get it together through the week. Uh, good call. I appreciate it. 426 the time. Got a surprise for you. Coming up in about 15 minutes. No, you don't want to miss this. 1-800-288-WBAP, 1-800-288-9227. I'm Rick Roberts. This is the Court of Public Opinion on News Talk 820 WBAP. All right, 434 the time. Glad you're along. Well, if you're in California, you don't have to worry about it. As soon as you cross the state line, they wrap you in bubble wrap and put you in a watertight can. No, I don't know. Uh, the state of California could be the uh, first state. Illinois is looking at it. New York is looking at it. Banning tackle football until you get to high school. Um, let's uh, let's go. Where am I going? David and Levon. David, thank you very much. I appreciate your patience. How you doing? Hey, Rick. I like your show. Thank you. Hey, listen, I was telling your screener, David, uh, good name. Uh, <laughs> I played football in Ada. I, I grew up in, I was born in Tulsa, grew up in Ada. And, uh, of course, my dad, you know, I played Pop Warner football and Kiwanis Little League baseball and all that. Right. I started in baseball in high school, but I I, I sat on the bench. I told your screener I guarded that bench and guarded the water bottle uh, <laughs> in, in football. But, you know, what's funny, I look back, the uh, – I always had to have my helmet special ordered even back then because I had the biggest head. I had like a seven five eight head, and, and they never had so they had to order the best helmet of the day. You know, mine always looked like a pro helmet. Had the nice pro face mask and all that. And I'll never forget, I was walking off the field. I think we just beat Ardmore. And I never had a problem like when I played concussions or whatnot. But this kid took his helmet off and just walloped me on the top of my that's nice helmet I had. And that's probably the only time I came close to getting a concussion. But I mean, I played all through school, and I never had – I had more injuries in baseball, man, than football. Is that right? Is that wow. – Yes. Wow. I was a catcher. Uh, you know, you'd get a bat in the stomach every now and then or whatever, get a foul ball, hit, you know, knock a, a chip a tooth or something, you know. But but my dad, uh, he always pushed us. Uh, you know, of course, when I got into the, the junior high and high school, you know, the, the, the coaches took over. But, but they were almost like your former caller. They're like, well, you know, you got to do this technique and this technique. And, but my dad was like, you knock the crap out of them, you know, and, and we'll see him in church on Sunday. Don't worry about it. Just, just knock the crap yeah, out of them. You know, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things, as long as they have good coaching, uh, because uh -huh. they can hurt themselves. They, they can, yeah. you know, screw around and hurt themselves. As long as you got good coaching, um, and, and there is a period of time where the dads, you know, they kind of lead the, the effort. And that's not a good right. thing. I've never thought that was a good thing. Um, no. well, it just well, most of the dads are just living vicariously through their kids. That's and, what it is. And that, that's exactly what it is. And it's yeah. not that, a good that thing. Was hardest, that was the hardest thing for my dad to do when we got into high school, that he had to just, you know, sit on his hands. He couldn't do anything. In junior high and high school, he just had to sit back. And, you know, he coached all these years, and then he had to sit back because he wasn't a teacher or a coach, you know. But right. Uh, right. I was going to ask you, you, uh, I know you, I know you have some Oklahoma City connections. Uh, 
I went to school with a guy. I don't know if he's at Putnam City or North. His name's Mark Landreth. I don't know if that name rings a bell to you. That's vaguely uh, familiar. Yeah. When I when I went yeah, to yeah. Putnam City, there was only one, uh, and they were building West at the time. I think. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good talking to you, Rick. I appreciate appreciate your time. All right, I appreciate it, David. Thank Bye. you so much. Uh, let's go to uh, Jason. Jason, thank you for waiting. How you doing, Jason? I'm all right, Rick. Thanks for having me. You bet. Hey, so in my opinion, I'm I'm a, I'm a Pee Wee coach. Uh, I've coached my son and and others from about third grade on up to sixth grade, and and my son's going into to play next year in junior high ball. Um, but in my opinion. I, I think you want us to have those kids play at that age because by the time they get to my son's age in junior high, they're big and they can do some damage. Uh, we teach them all the fundamentals. We've got to, to be a coach. We've got to go through the, the whole tackle training uh, and all that kind of stuff that goes along with it. And we, and we teach those fundamentals that are important so they don't get themselves hurt when they're big enough to do that. Well, you know, I, I tell the story, um, you know, my son was a little scrawny guy. I mean, he was little, um, he was always left-handed. So I tried to push him towards baseball, but he loved football. So he played both. Um, and then, then all of a sudden he hit this growth spurt, shot up to about six, four, almost six, five, 240 pounds. And it was like, good Lord. I, I stopped playing catch with him about, I don't know, 16 or 17, um, because he was throwing 85 mile an hour breaking fastballs at 16 years old. And he was just, he just got too big. Um, and you know, he switched from quarterback to linebacker and he loved it because he got to hit people all the time, but he uh, never got injured because he knew what to do to protect himself. And he learned that in junior high. He didn't learn that in high school. Sure. Sure. And then also I can't speak for every league out there, but I, I know that in our league, uh, here in Whitney, Texas, uh, each level has um, a weight limit. So uh, my son, for instance, was always a very large kid, and he always got a big X on the top of his helmet, and that delineated <laughs> that, that that kid can't progress the football. Even if it's fumbled and he goes to pick it up as a lineman, uh, per our league rules, he can't run with that ball just so he doesn't go and smack across the right. little 60-pound right. kid that's, that's also in his age group. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't think, well, no, I know that people that don't have kids uh, involved in, in football um, probably look at it and go, good Lord, they're killing each other. Um, and they're hitting, they're smacking each other around, um, but they also know how to do it so that they're, you know, they're not getting a concussion each time. You know, I Absolutely. I had a hard time trying to get my son. He led with his head and always did. And it, he was coached around that and around that and around that. And for his trouble, he got two concussions. Like I said, he knocked Bradford out of one game. Uh, and then the same game, he got he knocked out. It, he was able to walk off. They didn't have to use the gator. But, uh, I mean, I don't. Th these kids are going to do this no matter what. Uh, you know, if you're going to do something like this, I want you trained how to do it. Um, how to Absolutely. take, how to take a hit, how to give a hit. You know, there's a lot of guys that are injured giving hits and it's, uh, you know, I, I just think this is maybe taking a good idea and it's always a good idea to try and, you know, find more ways to keep kids safe. But I think maybe this is taking it too far. Yeah, a little bit too far. <laughs> Jason, I appreciate the call very, very much. Please don't be a stranger. Let's go to Lisa. In Arlington, Lisa, thanks for waiting. How you doing, Lisa? I'm doing great, Rick. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, I had a different perspective on this because I'm a girl and I haven't played football, but I was a competitive national gymnast from age four to age sixteen. Now, see, that's that's I just crazy. You, you wouldn't get me doing <laughs> that, no. I got a lot of concussions, and because you you learn by falling, and that's there's no way to not do it. You fall and my friends that want to put their kids in gymnastics starting at 9 and 10, I highly advise against it. Because when you're 3 and 4 learning it, you're made of rubber. <laughs> and you're not, you're not going to get hurt as much. Um, you know, at 15, I took a pretty good fall and got knocked out and woke up in the hospital. That's, that's the nature of gymnastics. But nobody thinks about that because they don't think that girls can get hurt the way that boys can get hurt. 
You know, now, that's, my, uh, that's a pretty, uh, you know, that's a, a good angle. I hadn't thought about that, but, you know, I see some of the stuff, and I know I used to take my daughter to gymnastics, but, I mean, she was little bitty, and they bounce around and fall down and all that kind of, to yeah. try and go in there at, at high school, that's nuts. Yeah, you would never in a million years because your body wouldn't be able to handle it. But now I do have a nephew that wanted to play football, and like the previous caller said, there's some kids that are too big. At 12 years old, my nephew is six foot tall. Wow, wow. They won't let him play because he would probably kill a kid. But I do know in, like I said, I did gymnastics. I competed around the country. I loved the hell out of it. It was the greatest thing in my life. And if I fall down now, I know how to fall still. Exactly. Because See, that's they the teach point. you that. That's the point. And, you know, when by the time guys get to high school, they've been hit. Uh, they've given hits. Uh, they've, you know, certain things you do when you, okay, it's coming. And there's certain things you do to, to lessen the impact. You're not going to learn that at high school. I mean, you will. No, but not. And it's, it's just going to be more dangerous because I can tell or I could tell halfway through a start if I was going to have a successful flip or, bat, you know, rounders, or if I was going to fall. I could tell if I angled my body far enough, if I twisted too far, if I was going to fall on my face or I was going to fall on my butt. I knew I was going to fall, and it was going to happen. But if I would have tried to learn that at high school, I would have ended up with a broken neck. Yeah, and probably. that's what I'm afraid is going to happen. And I'm from Illinois originally, so I'm afraid that's what the idiots in Illinois are going to do to these kids, is they're going to try to teach them in junior high or high school, and they're going to end up getting killed. A good, Lisa, very good angle. Very, very good angle. I'm glad you called. Please don't be a stranger. 4.44 the time. Got a surprise for you when we come back on News Talk 820 WBAP.